Good afternoon. Our next topic for today is about kidney transplantation. Ullman reported the first attempted human kidney transplant in 1902. So for the next 50 years, sporadic attempts all ended in either technical failure or in graft failure from rejection. So Joseph Murray performed the first successful kidney transplant in 1954 an epochal event in the history of organ transplantation. So in the first case, the immunologic barrier was circumvented by transplanting a kidney between identical twins. So for his pivotal contribution, Murray Ster shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1990s with E. Donald Thomas for their discoveries concerning organ and cell transplantation in the treatment of human disease. So the introduction of Imuran or AZA in the 1960 marked the beginning of a new era in kidney transplantation with the combination of steroids and Imuran for maintenance immunosuppression. The one-year graft survival rate with a living related donor kidney approached 80%. So with a decreased donor kidney, the rate was with a deceased uh, donor kidney, the, the rate was 65%. In the ensuing years, major milestones included the reduction of more effective immunosuppressive medications with lower toxicity profiles, such as polyclonal anti-lymphocyte, lobulin in the 1970s, cyclosporine in the 1980s, tacrolimus in the 1990s, and biologics in the first decade of the 21st century, as previously mentioned. Parallel to the developments in medical science were the transplant community's concerned efforts to improve use of healthcare resources. So in the United States, the Social Security Amendments of the 1972 provided Medicare coverage for patients with end-stage renal disease, ESRD. So the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984 initiated the process of creating that later became UNOS, an umbrella organization to ensure access to organs by patients in need. So to enhance organ procurement and allocation and to improve post-transplant outcomes. This infrastructure later became the blueprint for other countries to follow. As a result, organ transplantation is the most transparent field of medicine. Data such as transplant center performance are readily available on public websites. Penalties for violation of regulations and for underperformance often results in transplant programs being shut down. Today, a kidney transplant remains the most definitive and durable renal replacement therapy for patients with end-stage renal disease. It offers better survival and improved quality of life and is considered more cost-effective than dialysis. According to the 2016 Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients Annual Report, nearly 100,000 adult patients were on the kidney transplant waiting list while nearly 20,000 underwent renal transplantation. Trends over the past decades indicated that living-related transplants remained relatively stable while the number of deceased donor transplants rose. Post-transplant outcomes have continued to improve in 2015. The one-year graft survival rate with a living donor kidney was nearly 98%. With a deceased donor kidney, the rate was approximately 95%. The advantages of a living donor kidney transplant include better post-transplant outcomes, avoidance of prolonged waiting time and dialysis, and the ability to coordinate the donor and recipient procedures in a timely fashion. Living donor kidney recipients enjoy better long-term outcomes. A low, incidence. a low incidence of delayed graft function and reduced risk of post-transplant transplant complications. Furthermore, the, the elective nature of living donor kidney transplants provides unique opportunities for recipient desensitization treatment if the donor and the recipient are ABO incompatible or if with the HLA cross-match 
results are positive. So this is how to do a kidney transplant. So you you harvest from the from the site of the kidney and then you put it into the recipients where it is mostly implanted near the pelvic area. Some of the challenges of transplant professionals are closing the gap between supply and demand and thereby reducing the current prolonged waiting times, refining immunosuppressive medications to achieve better outcomes with reduced toxicity and caring for patients who develop rejection, especially antibody-mediated rejection. Active infection or the presence of a malignancy, active substance abuse, and poorly controlled psychiatric illness are the few absolute contraindications to kidney transplant. Studies have demonstrated the overwhelming benefits of kidney transplant in terms of patient survival, quality of life, cost effectiveness, so most patients with end-stage renal disease are referred for consideration of a kidney transplant. However, to achieve optimal transplant outcomes, the many risks such as surgical stress to the cardiovascular system, the development of infections or malignancies with long-term immunosuppression, and the psychosocial and financial impacts on compliance must be carefully balanced. Any problem? Any problems detected during the evaluation of transplant candidates are communicated to their referring physician and or to a specialist if advanced evaluation and treatment are needed. So ultimately, improving overall care. Essentially, the pre-transplant evaluation is a multifaceted approach. So to patient education and disease management. Before the pre-transplant uh, medical evaluation begins, kidney transplant candidates are encouraged to attend a group meeting focused on patient education. The meeting is coordinated by a transplant physician or a surgeon. The intent is to familiarize patients with the pre-transplant evaluation process and with pertinent medical concepts and terms. In, open, in an open forum format, Important decisions such as type of donor, living versus deceased, are discussed. The group meeting empowers patients to fully participate in their care and serve as an impetus for a meaningful dialogue with healthcare professionals. Diabetes and hypertension are the leading causes of chronic renal disease. Incomitant cardiovascular disease is a common finding in this population. An estimated 30% of to 42% of deaths with a functioning kidney are due to CVD. Therefore, assessment of the potential kidney transplant candidate's cardiovascular status is an important part of pre-transplant evaluation. In fact, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Foundation recently published their expert consensus on CVD evaluation and management for solid organ transplant candidates. The process should focus on careful screening for the presence of significant cardiac conditions, for example, angina, valvular disease, and arrhythmias, and for a prior history of congestive heart failure, coronary interventions, or valvular surgery. The perioperative uh, risk assessment is based on patient symptoms and exercise tolerance. For all kidney transplant candidates, a resting 12 bleed ECG should be obtained. In addition, this population, in this population, the use of echocardiography to analyze all ventricular function and to assess for pulmonary hypertension is useful. So here is a uh, an algorithm that they use. So stress testing may be considered in patients with no active cardiac condition, but with risk factors such as diabetes, hemodialysis for more than one year, left ventricular hypertrophy, age greater than 60 years, smoking, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. 
the utility of non-invasive stress testing as compared with angiographic studies for evaluating coronary artery disease is controversial. An additional prognostic marker is the troponin T level. Because of the long-term use of immunosuppressive medications, transplant recipients are at increased risk for development malig of malignancies. Untreated on and or active malignancies are absolute contraindications to transplant, with two exceptions, non-melanocytic skin cancer and incidental renal cancer identified at the time of concurrent nephrectomy for polycystic kidney and renal transplantation. For for those patients who have undergone treatment of low-grade um, tumors with a low risk of recurrence, completely locally excised low-grade squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, colon cancer in a polyp absence, stock invasion, a wait of at least two years after successful treatment is recommended before a kidney transplant can be considered. However, for certain types of tumors, especially at advanced stages or with a risk of recurrence, melanoma, lymphoma, renal cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, a delay of at least five years is advisable. According to the Israel Pen International Transplant Tumor Registry, tumor recurrence post-transplant is not infrequent. The recurrence rate is 67% in patients with multiple myeloma, 53% in non-melanocytic skin cancer, 29% in bladder cancer, and 23% in breast cancer. A thorough history of infections and immunization should be obtained from transplant candidates. So who need, who need all recommended age-appropriate vaccinations according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines? Ideally, Vaccination should be completed at least four to six weeks before the, the kidney transplant takes place. Immunosuppressive medications blunt the immune response and reduce the effectiveness of vaccinations. Even more important, with attenuated vaccines, vaccine-derived infections could occur. If a splenectomy is anticipated in recipients whose donor is ABO incompatible or whose HLA cross-mass results are positive, then they should be immunized against encapsulated organisms such as Neisseria meningitides, Mophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, well in advance of the splenectomy. Transplant candidates should undergo routine tuberculosis screening. According to the Center for Disease Control in 2016, 9 9,272 TB cases were diagnosed in the United States with 68.5% of cases occurring in the foreign-born persons. Serologic screening combined with a chest x-ray for fungal infections um, such as co coccygeal mycosis or histoplasmosis in patients who have a history of those infections or are from an endemic area are recommended. So chronic infections such as osteomyelitis or endocarditis must be fully treated. So a suitable waiting period after successful treatment must occur in order to ensure that relapse does not occur. Hepatitis can be caused by five different types of viruses. Hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. With the first three being the most common, acute viral hepatitis is a contraindication to kidney transplant. However, chronic viral hepatitis, most commonly caused by hepatitis B or C, does not preclude the recipient from undergoing a kidney transplant. In such candidates, obtaining a liver biopsy is essential to assess the disease severity. Resistant uh, recipients infected with, with hepatitis B virus should undergo antiviral treatment to prevent reactivation and progression of liver disease. Note that Hepatitis B virus is a non-cytopathic virus. The liver damage is the result of an immune-mediated process. Moreover, the presence of normal liver enzymes in patients with hepatitis B virus antigenemia does not predict the severity of parenchymal damage.
transplant candidates with chronic hepatitis C virus infection often have HCV-related dromeronephritis. So as with the hepatitis B virus infection, the clinical presentation and biochemical findings with hepatitis C virus infection are often unreliable in predicting liver damage. So in such patients who also exhibit evidence of cirrhosis, a combined liver kidney transplant should be considered. However, uh, after a kidney transplant, interferon treatment is not recommended because it is an immunostimulant and thus HIV may precipitate graft rejection. Thanks to the excellent outcomes of highly active antiretroviral therapy, infection with HIV is no longer considered a contraindication to a kidney transplant. Kidney transplant candidates with HIV must have an undetectable HIV viral load and a CD4 lymphocyte count greater than 200 mm3. In addition, they must not have developed any opportunistic infection in the previous year. Latent viral infections such as cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus are a part of interest in the field of transplantation. Given the risk of reactivation post-transplant and their detrimental effects on the graft and patient survival, so knowing that CMV and EBV serologic status of the patient and the donor helps per transplant professionals gauge the risk of immunosuppressive regimens in relation to potential infection, so thereby guiding plans for post-transplant antiviral uh, prophylaxis treatment or avoiding transplant transplants between a seropositive donor and a seronaive recipient. The third most common cause of graft loss in kidney transplant recipients is recurrence of glomerular disease such as segment, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, immunoglobulin A, IJ nephropathy, hemolytic uremic syndrome, systemic lupus, lupus erythematosus, and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. FSGS deserves special mention due to its frequent occurrence and dramatic presentation of early graft loss. An estimated 30% to 40% of vocal segmental glomerulosclerosis patients develop recurrent disease post-transplant. Of those, up to half eventually lost, lose their graft. In recipients with history of vocal segmental glomerulosclerosis, post-transplant nephrotic proteinuria should be promptly investigated. If diagnosis is confirmed by transplant kidney biopsy, rescue plasma paresis should be instituted, instituted at once. Adjuvant uh, therapy with rituximab has been proposed. Kidney transplant candidates with a history of thrombotic events, repeated miscarriages, or a family history of thrombophilia should be screened for following cobulopathic disorders. So activated protein C, resistance ratio, factor 5 laden uh, mutation, factor 2, 20, 10 gene mutation, uh, anti antiphospholipid antibody, lupus anticoagulant, protein C or S deficiency, antithrobin 3 deficiency, and hyperchromocystinemia. In patients at risk for hypercoagulopathy, pediatric kidney grafts and any kidney allografts with a complex vascular anatomy should be avoided. So per a perioperative anticoagulation protocol is recommended in this population. <sighs> kidney transplant candidates, pediatric patients in particular, with chronic uh, kidney disease as a result of congenital or genitourinary abnormalities should undergo a thorough urologic evaluation. Avoiding cystourethrogram and a complete lower urinary tract evaluation to rule out outlet obstruction are essential. So indications for the native nephrectomy include chronic nephritis, large polycystic kidneys, with loss of intraabdominal domain, significant vesicourethral reflux, or uncontrollable renovascular hypertension. The potential implant sites for a kidney graft include 
the recipients iliac vessels and less commonly the aorta and vena cava. Careful physical examination often reveals significant central or peripheral vascular disease. Findings such as pulsatile intraabdominal mass, diminished or absent peripheral pulse, collodication, rest pain, and tissue loss in lower extremities should be further evaluated by abdominal computed tomography scan or ultrasound. Doppler studies and or angiography with the popularity of endovascular interventions, transplant surgeons also should be similar, familiar with such technology and obtain detailed anatomic studies of patients with vascular stents. ABO blood typing and HLA typing are required before a kidney transplant. The method of screening for preformed antibodies against HLA antigens because of prior transplants, blood transfusion, or pregnancies continues to evolve. The panel reactive antibody PRA assay is a screening test that examines the ability of serum from a kidney transplant candidate to lyse lymphocytes from a panel of HLA type donors. A numeric value expressed as a percentage indicates the likelihood of positive cross match with a donor. A higher, a higher PRA level identifies patients at high risk for positive cross match and therefore serves as a surrogate marker to measure the difficulty of finding a suitable donor and the subsequent risk of graft rejection. An important development in anti-HLA antibody screening is the Luminex technology using HLA-coated fluorescent microbeads and flow cytometry which is considered the gold standard. This technology pinpoints donor-specific antibodies in the serum of a kidney transplant candidate with a high PRA level since all organ donors must undergo HLA typing. A negative cross match for recipients with a high PRA level can be ensured by avoiding the selection of donors carrying unacceptable antigens. Kidney transplant candidate data are entered into a nationwide central database to facilitate disease donor kidney allocation as described earlier. Psychiatric disorders have been recognized as an important contributing factor to poor outcomes post-transplant. Patients with uncontrolled psychiatric disorders are at high risk for non-compliance with drug treatment, impaired cognitive function, and the development of substance abuse. A robust psychosocial evaluation is essential to ensure that the transplant candidates understand the risk and benefits of the procedure and that they adhere to the lifetime immunosuppressive medication regimen. Kidney allografts usually are transplanted heterotypically, so the iliac fossa is recognized as the ideal position because of its proximity to the recipient's bladder and iliac vessels. Retroperitoneal allograft placement also allows EC2 access for percutaneous biopsies and interventions for ureteral complications. The iliac fossa is the preferred site because of its EC access to the recipient's iliac vessels. However, if a pancreas transplant is anticipated in the future or if now failed kidney grafts have been placed um, at the right iliac fossa, then the, iliac, then the left iliac fossa is used for implantation. The current surgical technique for kidney transplant was developed and popularized in the 1950s and 1960s and has changed little since. A large bore three lumen urinary catheter is inserted after the recipient is anesthetized and it is occluded with a clamp beneath the surgical drapes. So recipients whose native kidneys produce urine will naturally fill up the urinary bladder. Those individuals whose kidneys do not 
will require insufflation of saline prior to creation if the ureteral anastomosis or of the ureteral anastomosis. Exposure of the operative fields starts with the curvilinear skin incision, one to two finger widths from the midline, pubic bone, and the lateral edge of the rectus sheath. Superiorly, the extension of the incision depends on the recipient's body habitus and the size of the toner kidney. The anterior rectus sheath is incised medially to laterally until the lateral edge of the rectus sheath is exposed. The posterior rectus sheath is missing below the arcuate line, thus providing direct access to the extraperitoneal space. The rectus muscle can be easily mobilized medially without being divided. The remainder of the fascial incision is along the lateral edge of the rectus sheath until the desired exposure is achieved. The retroperitoneal space of the iliac fossa is entered by mobilizing the peritoneum medially. The inferior epigastric vessels and the round ligament in females and the spermatic cord and its vasculature in males are encouraged in this space. The former two structures are divided while the latter is retracted with a vascular loop. A self-retained retractor is used to expose the surgical field. The iliac vessel should be dissected with great care to minimize the risk of lymphocele development postoperatively. The section of the iliac artery should be limited. The intertwining lymphatics around the iliac vessel should be ligated. In general, the donor's renal artery and vein are anastomosed to the recipient external iliac fossa, iliac vessels in an end-to-end, end-to-side fashion. So in, re uh, in recipients with severely calcified iliac artery, the internal iliac artery can be used as an alternative. And in select cases, an enterarterectomy must be performed. So after restoring the circulation to the donor's kidney, urinary continuity can be established via several approaches. The approach chosen depends on such factors as the length of the donor ureter and the recipient's history of bladder surgery, native nephrectomy, or pelvic radiation. The two most common procedures to, to restore Mm, urinary continuity or the lead better politano, a large histostomy is created in the dome of the bladder and the donor ureter is brought through a lateral and somewhat inferior 1 cm submucosal tunnel into the bladder, the end of which is spatulated and the sewn and then sewn in place without tension with interrupted absorbable sutures placed through the mucosa and submucosa on the inside of the bladder. So an extravesical ureteroneus estostomy is performed by careful dissection of a 1 cm portion of the muscular layers on the anterolateral portion of the bladder until a bubble of mucosa is exposed. The donor ureter is spatulated in a diamond-shaped fashion. The bladder mucosa is incised. Absorbable interrupted sutures are placed in four quadrants and a mucosa to mucosa anastomosis is created using running absorbable sutures with a temporary ureteral stent in place of the first three quarters of the anastomosis. The muscular layers of the bladder are then carefully approximated over the anastomosis to prevent reflux. The decision to place a ureteral stent depends on the surgeon who must try to balance the risk of infection infectious complication with possible technical complications of ureteral anastomosis, but in general, this is not required except during the rarely performed donor ureter to recipient's ureter anastomosis or in case of a pediatric kidney transplant. Fixation of the donor's kidney is not necessary except in the case of small kidneys, usually from a pediatric donor or end block kidneys. Here is a video of uh, how to do a kidney transplant. This is a video about kidney transplantation. You do an in 
an incision in the lower quadrant area of the abdomen. You can see here the it is being carried down up to the level of the the iliac vessels. So as you can see, those are the iliac vein and the iliac arteries. Then you transplant the donor uh, kidney into that area near the vessels. You reanastomose the vessels first by doing the renal vein into the iliac vein. It's either the external iliac or the internal iliac. And then you anastomose the common iliac into the renal artery. So you connect it end to side anastomosis. Then you clamp it to check for any leakage. And then you now prepare the ureter to be anastomosed to the or reimplanted to the urinary bladder. So you prepare the bladder. You spatulate the ureter. You incise on the bladder and do a ureteroneocystostomy. You put a stent prior, then you prepare it, then you close it, close the bladder by doing cystography, and then they close the layers of the skin and the muscle, and then you're done. In 10 per to 30% of donor kidneys, Multiple renal arteries are encountered. So unless kidney transplant candidates have hypercoagulopathy, grafts with the multiple renal arteries fare as well as those with single vessels. Vascular reconstruction options include implanting the donor's arteries separately, reconstructing the multiple arteries into a common channel, or combining, or combining multiple arteries to a common carrel patch. So debate persists about whether to implant kidneys obtained from young donors less than 5 years or whose body weight is under for 20 kilograms as a single end block unit into one recipient or separately into recipients. The underlying issues are the shortage of donor organs, the complexity of surgical procedure and the risk of graft thrombosis, ureteral complications and long-term outcomes. In end block kidney transplant, the donor aorta and vena cava are used as the vascular inflow and outflow conduit. So therefore, reconstruction of the end block graft pre-transplant is key to successful transplant. The donor suprarenal vena cava and aorta are oversown. The lumbar branches of the cava and the aorta are ligated. Dissection around the <coughs> renal hilum should be avoided. The orientation of the cava and the aorta should be clearly marked in order to avoid torsion of the anastomosis. If the color of the two kidneys looks different from reperfusion, repositioning should be attempted to rule out vascular torsion. Fixation of end block kidneys to the retroperitoneum is often necessary. The donor's ureter are implanted to the recipient's bladder either as a tuperate anastomosis or as a common patch. Only a handful of centers have performed an end block kidney transplant, but the long term outcomes are encouraging. Preoperatively, a thorough history and physical exam should be performed. Any changes in the transplant candidate's recent medical history should be investigated in great detail. In those recipients with a histor historically negative PRA level who have recently undergone blood transfusions, a prospective tissue cross-match is necessary to avoid graft rejection. Electrolyte panels should be checked. Emergency dialysis may be necessary for transplant candidates experiencing hyperkalemia or fluid overload. For dialysis-dependent candidates, the catheter sites should be examined preoperatively to rule out infections. 
Vascular access or hemodialysis is essential to avoid complications related to post-transplant acute tubular necrosis. Vascular evaluation is mandatory. Any changes in results should be investigated by appropriate imaging studies. As is routine for other major surg surgical procedures, transplant candidates should preoperatively undergo a chest x-ray. To be the ECG, blood typing, cross-match, test, and prophylaxis against surgical site infection by administration of a non-neprotoxic antibiotic with activity against both common skin microflora and gram-negative pathogens. Candidates should receive nothing to eat or drink. Intraoperatively, transplant recipients should be kept well hydrated to avoid acute tubular necrosis and should receive heparin prior to vascular occlusion. Before reperfusion of the transplanted kidney, the desired central venous pressure should be maintained at around 10 mmHg, and the systolic blood pressure should be above 120 mmHg. In pediatric patients of an adult graft, a superphysiologic condition may be necessary to avoid acute tubular necrosis or graft thrombosis. Manitol often is administered before reperfusion as a radical scavenger and diuretic agent and a diuretic such as furosemide is administered as well. Postoperatively, the guiding principles for the care of kidney transplant recipients are the same as for any other surgical patients. The critical elements include hemodynamic stability and fluid and electrolyte balance. To achieve a volemic state, the recipient's urine output is replaced with either an equal or a reduced volume of IV fluid on an hourly basis, depending on the medical status of the patient. In recipients undergoing brisk diuresis, aggressive replacement of electrolytes including calcium, magnesium, and potassium may be necessary. In recipients experiencing acute tubular necrosis, fluid overload or hyperkalemia, however, fluid restriction Treatment for hyperkalemia and even hemodialysis may be necessary. Hypotension is an unusual event immediately post-transplant. The differential diagnoses include hypovolemia, vasodilatation, and myocardial infarction with cardiac failure. Immediate action should be taken to avoid life-threatening complications. So post-transplant hypertension can be mediated by catecholamines, fluid overload, or immunosuppressive agents. Postoperatively, urine output is used as a surrogate marker to monitor graft function. Among recipients whose native kidneys produce significant amounts of urine, normal or increased urine output may be misleading. For them, serum, blood, urea, and nitrogen and creatinine levels are more reliable indicators of kidney graft function. Suddenly decrease or minimal urine output requires immediate attention. A change in volume status is the most common cause, but other culprits include blockage of the urinary catheter, urinary leak, vascular thrombosis, hypotension, drug-related neprotoxicity, acute tubular necrosis, and rejection, all of which must be thoroughly investigated. Diagnostic studies such as Doppler ultrasound, nuclear urinograms, or biopsies should be considered. Postoperatively, bleeding is an uncommon event after a kidney transplant. Recipients on anticoagulation or antiplatelet treatments are at an increased risk. So, signs and symptoms such as an expanding hematoma over the surgical site, increased pain over the graft, a failing hemoglobin level, hypotension, and tachycardia should be aroused, suspicion of hemorrhage. So Doppler ultrasound is useful to establish the underlying cause. Surgical exploration seldom is required because the accumulated hematoma tamponades the bleed. Indications for surgical exploration include ongoing transfusion requirement, hemodynamic instability, and graft dysfunction from hematoma compression. For recipients on anticoagulation or antiplatelet treatments, the threshold for surgical exploration is lower. So small unligated vessels at the donor's renal hilum or recipient's retroperitoneum are likely sources of bleeding. 
one of the most devastating postoperative complications in kidney recipients is graft thrombosis. It is rare, occurring in fewer than 1% of recipients. The recipient risk factors include a history of recipients' hypercoagulopathy and severe peripheral vascular disease. Donor-related risk factors include the use of end block or pediatric donor kidneys. Procurement damage technical factors such as intimal dissection or torsion of vessels and hyperacute rejection. Graft thrombosis usually occurs within the first several days post-transplant. Acute cessation of urine output in recipients with brittle uh, post-transplant diuresis and the sudden onset of hematuria or graft pain should arouse suspicion of graft thrombosis. Doppler ultrasound may help confirm the diagnosis. In cases of graft thrombosis, an urgent thrombectomy is indicated. However, it rarely results in graft salvage. Graft thrombosis usually occurs in the first several days post-transplant. Acute cessation of urine output in recipients with a brittle post-transplant diuresis and the sudden onset of hematuria or graft pain should arouse suspicion of graft thrombosis. Doppler ultrasound may help confirm the diagnosis. In cases of graft thrombosis, an urgent thrombectomy is indicated. However, it rarely results in graft salvage. Urologic complications are seen in up to 5% of recipients. The cause is often related to ureteral ischemia, damage during procurement of the donor's distal ureter, or technical errors. So symptoms of urine leak include fever, pain, swelling at the graft site, increased creatinine level, decreased urine output, and cutaneous urinary drainage. So diagnosis can be confirmed by a combination of ultrasound, nuclear renography, drainage of perinephric fluid collection, and comparison of serum and fluid creatinine levels. Depending on the location and volume of the urine leak, satisfactory results can be achieved by surgical exploration and repair of percutaneous placement of a nephrostomy tube and ureteral stenting. Depending on the location of the volume of the urine leak, satisfactory results can be achieved by surgical exploration and repair by percutaneous placement of nephrostomy and ureteral stenting. So early urinary obstruction can be due to edema, blood clots, torsion of the ureter or compression from a hematoma. So late urinary obstruction is often related to ischemia. The appearance of hydronephrosis on ultrasound is a good in in the initial indicator. Treatment includes percutaneous placement of a nephrostomy and ureteral stenting. If transilluminal intervention fails, surgical intervention such as ureteral reimplantation or a ureteropyelostomy can be undertaken. So this is how a kidney transplant is being done. So you transplant the kidney in the iliac fossa. Monitor for early and late complications. A kidney transplant remains the most common solid organ transplant in the world today. So with the introduction of uh, induction immunosuppressive therapy and ever-improving less toxic immunosuppressive medications, post-transplant outcomes have become better and better. And as noted above, post-transplant outcomes have continued to improve. In 2014, allograft and patient survival rates were well over 90%. And in 2015, the one-year graft survival rate with a living donor kidney was nearly 98%. So with a deceased donor kidney, the rate was approximately 95%. The biggest improvements have been in the reduction of a one-year graft failure. So with a de deceased donor kidney, the one-year graft failure rate dropped from approximately 20% in 1989 to less than 7% in 2009 and in 4.8% in 2015. With the living donor kidney, the rate dropped from 8.5% in 1989 to less than 3% in 2015. Furthermore, steroid-free protocols and calcineurin-free protocols have been validated and implemented in the last several decades, further reducing medication-related side effects and vastly improving the quality of life of for tens of thousands of recipients. 
Currently, the most common cause of graft loss is recipient death, usually from cardiovascular causes, with a functioning graft. The second most common cause is chronic allograft nephropathy, characterized by a slow and relenting deterioration of graft function. It likely has multiple causes, both immunologic and non-immunologic. The graft failure rate due to complications related to surgical technique has remained at about 1-2%. to That's all for now. Thank you.